What are y'all waiting on me or what? How are y'all today? Good morning. Oh, that's pretty lukewarm. Okay. I'm glad you're here today. And it'd be that time for little kids to be dismissed. Nicole and Lynn and Jennifer are all in the back. And heading back, any other kids up to fifth grade, go back right now. And you guys can head that way to be able to get some children's church time in. And it is a potluck today. Oh, James, good to see you, brother. How you doing? Man, I'm glad you're here. We're just going to do all good old sandwiches today. That's us flying high on the hog. No filet mignon. But it's not bologna sandwiches. Can I get an amen? That's right. There you go. Man, I'm really glad that you're here today. Uh, as people have been asking me about the Hawaiian shirts, hey, what's all the Hawaiian shirt stuff? Well, if you're a member or a regular attender, we should have your email. We send an email blast out every Thursday saying little special things coming up for Sunday. Some things that have happened in the past, upcoming things. And so if you don't get a Thursday email blast, you need to see Tracy. Tracy, wave your hand. There she is. You can still pick on PJ if you want to. She's over there holding a baby, and she doesn't want to be picked on right now. <laughs> but we would love to have your email address, and we usually send that out by the afternoon on Thursdays. And it's just kind of past sermons. If you missed a sermon and you want to see one, we'll have a link there. And also you can kind of... Is that Candace in the back? Whoop! Oh, yeah, she's trying not to be seen. Candace, hi, good to see you. Is that your little brother with you there? Oh, yeah, so thank you, baby. So, hey, uh, just uh, that's, we put, the, put it in the email blast uh, about Hawaiian shirt. Thir- or this last Thursday, we put it in Hawaiian shirts. And if you don't have a Hawaiian shirt, Kate's going shopping for Hawaiian shirt later on. And so she's like, no, don't do that to me. Man. If you're a guest or visitor here today, we just want to say welcome. If you hadn't been here in a while, welcome back. Uh, we hope that uh, you will uh, stay for lunch and enjoy a potluck lunch with us today on, on our sandwich potluck. And uh, we also hope that, uh, that if you have any questions that you'll ask someone and stuff. Oh, now they're pointing out Rob in the back. Hey, Rob, good to see you, brother. Where's, where's, where's those chairs you used to sit in the principal's office? Like right up front, there's like three chairs right here, right? Next to Jason and so, uh, stuff. Anyway. Man, I'm glad you're here. Uh, if you're a first-time visitor, you should have got a yellow card at the front uh, door when you came in. If you would just fill that out and put that in the uh, big box between the doors over here or the box on your table, then we'll send you a hi, hello, thanks for coming and visiting us. So if it is your first Sunday, uh, then we're, we're kind of in the middle of a seven-part sermon series, and we're just unpacking the doctrinal position here at Solid Rock Church. We're talking about... What do we believe and why do we believe it? And just going through identifying that and being able to, um, to talk about that because sometimes, uh, and I've known people to go to a church that gone like, gee, I, I really don't know what we think about Jesus. Or I don't know what we think about sin or eternal separation or eternity in a heaven. And, and so coming back off my sabbatical in June, I said, man, what a great place to start. We just need to kind of say out loud what we believe, why we believe it. And then people can look at that and say, here's where they stand. Some people are not going to agree with us. Amen. But that's OK. They have to make that decision and then stand in that decision before the Lord. So we've been packing, unpacking some of the major doctrinal statements from our bylaws. By the way, our bylaws are on our website online. You can see exactly everything I'm preaching on comes straight from the bylaws. And you can go see what our bylaws talk about. So today's a two for sermon. Y'all get two sermons in one? All of God's people said amen, right? I knew Rob would be here, so I said, Rob, but I got to double down on Rob and give him a little extra and stuff. Amen, brother? Amen. <laughs> We're going to talk about two doctrinal statements in one sermon. So to help us get started, I thought uh, that this verse, our sermon verse, might set the backdrop a little bit. So Jesus is speaking here in our sermon verse today out of Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. Jesus says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? The first portion of our sermon deals with salvation. The second part, I will talk more specifically about eternal security. First up, let's talk about salvation. Our statement of faith says this on salvation, quote, We believe that salvation is God's free gift to all of mankind through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
We can never make up for our sin by self-improvement or good works. Only by trusting in Christ Jesus as God's offering of forgiveness can anyone be saved from sin's penalty. When we truly turn from our pride and self-ruled life to Jesus in faith, we are supernaturally saved by His sacrifice on our behalf. Eternal life begins the moment one receives Jesus Christ into his life by faith, end quote. Now, the slide coming up behind this slide that's up now are the scriptures that we utilize to look at that truth, that statement. We glean from these eight or nine scriptures up there that particular statement of faith. Those will be up for just a little bit if you want to write them down. You can do your own homework and check them out. And you can pull up our statement of faith on salvation and compare and see if we're, if, we're, if we're on course on that. And when we start talking about salvation, this, of course, raises many questions. In fact, too many questions for me to cover in one sermon today. Amen? amen. I think Jenny said amen like in a way I'm glad you're not going to talk and expand on these too much. But I'm not sure I heard that correctly. But I want you to know that when you start talking about Jesus and salvation, people are going to raise at least questions and often are going to raise doubts. Amen? They're going to want to know things about salvation and other religions or they want to talk about the goodness of mankind or, or how can a loving God send people to hell? And those are important questions, and we need to know how to respond and talk about those questions. And there are answers, biblical answers, for those questions, but I can't do that today. For today, I want us to, to, to consider a strong support from Scripture concerning salvation. We see Peter and John in, early in the book of Acts... Now, they have been arrested by the religious authorities in the day, and they're brought before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is a council, I believe, of about 80 learned scholars and religious types. They were the decision makers for Israel and determined what was of the law, what was of Moses, what they defined the doctrine, if you will, for Judaism. And Peter at that gathering, when the Sanhedrin are examining Peter and John, Peter has a powerful statement about Jesus at this gathering. At that gathering, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we see Peter say this, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, talk about the Sanhedrin and the Jewish religion, which has become the cornerstone. And there is no salvation in anyone else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Only Jesus saves. Jesus himself says, He is the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody can come to the Father except through Him. So as it relates to salvation, here at Solid Rock Church, Our confession is, our belief is, and our teachings are is that salvation is in Jesus alone. Because all of us here at Solid Rock Church have the temptation in the flesh to believe, well, you know, yeah, I like that Jesus do, but I'm a pretty good guy myself. My goodness can save me. Jason's intellect can save him. That's a smart guy right there. That's his wife laughing hysterically at him. But we tend to go like... I'm not really all that. All those other people are worse than I am. You know what? They may be worse than you. But unless you're perfect, you can't be saved. Only through Christ Jesus can we be received. So Jesus here for us at Solid Rock Church is the answer to man's fallen condition and the way to eternal life. Second for today, I want to talk about eternal security. Our doctrinal statement is we believe that because God gives us eternal life through Jesus Christ, the true believer is secure in that salvation for eternity. If you have been genuinely born again, and we put that in quotes in our doctrine, by the Spirit of God, you cannot lose your eternal life. Salvation is maintained by the power and grace of God, not the self-effort of man, end quote. 
Again, you're going to see coming up on the slide that we support our statement in these scriptures that comes up. And the truth is, is that in faith world today, in Christianity today, in today, there is discussion among Christians on whether or not a person can genuinely give their lives to Jesus and then lose their salvation. Can you really be saved and then be unsaved? Or do we believe that once saved, always saved? Well, the position at Solid Rock Church on this issue is expressed in our statement of belief. If you have been genuinely born again by the Spirit of God, you cannot lose your eternal salvation. Salvation is maintained by the power and grace of God, not the self-effort of man. I think, these ter- I think in these terms, when I look at our statement of faith, if I can really do nothing on my own efforts to save myself, then nothing I do can unsave myself. That, that my salvation is all in God's hands, and my salvation and eternal life is all in God's hands. God is sovereign on the matter of salvation. Let me present four scriptures, I think, that support our doctrinal statement on eternal security. Because eternal security is a big deal. Amen? Because there are some groups of believers that believe that you can't lose your salvation. And there's reasons within their doctrinal framework of why they say that. But here we will say, you can't save yourself, therefore you can't unsave yourself. Does that make sense? That we're leaving that up to God. The key for us here is... When people say, well, gosh, I knew a guy that was a Christian for 30 years and walked away from the church and isn't a Christian anymore. What's your point? Well, he went to church every Sunday. He was in the faith faith of some type for 30 years. Hey, look, two things I'll just tell you in just not a very long walk of faith in my own life is, number one, the fact that someone calls himself a Christian does not make them a Christian. Because that doesn't make you a Christian any more than you standing in a garage makes you a car. Right? The fact that you go to church, that you call yourself a Christian, does not that mean that you've ever come to a place of confessing Jesus as Lord and surrendering your life to Jesus. Amen? And so people sometimes, say, what about people that were there for 30 years and walked away? Say, look, man, people walked away from Jesus in the Bible. Does that mean they were saved? Our statement of faith says if you've really earnestly, honestly confessed Jesus as Lord and surrendered yourself. Have you surrendered yourself? Now, I know there's a couple of us in this room that that word surrender is really an uncomfortable word. Amen? I've told this several times, but I want to tell it again. And going through my former career as a police officer, and you you go through various trainings and that you learn you never surrender. Amen? Amen? You never give up your gun as a police officer. Raise your hands. That's as high as I'm raising my hands. You never surrender because if you surrender, you die in that job. It's a self-survival thing. But that's not a police thing, really. Really, it's a human flesh thing, isn't it? I don't want to surrender. I don't want to give up my control. And I don't know if you're like me or not, and I hope not. But sometimes I want to hang on to a little control. Well, you know, Jesus, I'll let you have this thing. But this thing over here, I'm pretty good with. This is a cherished little thing I want to hang on to because this is mine. I'm good at this. I have some control on this. Don't look over here. We're not fully surrendered. I think that's a, a big part of our sanctification process. Sanctification, big word for growing up in Jesus over our lives. Really, it's learning how do we surrender to God? How do we humble ourselves for God? Man, those are not popular words in the culture today, are they? Surrender. Humble yourself. Give up control. Our culture, our world fights against that because it's all about you and and it's you being the best you and it's you and your truth and what's good for you and you and you and you and you and we leave Jesus out of the equation. So four scriptures to support our doctrinal eternal security. First of all, Paul is clear that a true believer is kept secure by the power of God. He is sealed for the day of redemption. 
Consider Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. There Paul says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Sealed means we're attached to, we're stuck to, we're glued to, we're, we're with Jesus, that we, we are surrendered to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is God's stamp on us that we are His and that He walks and guides our lives. Second for today, we see all that those whom the Father has given to the Son, that the Son will not lose any of them. We read that from John chapter 6, verse 39 through 40. And this is, the, this is Jesus speaking. And this is the will of Him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that He has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up the last day. Woo! I wish my knees could make me Pentecostal and I could dance on that. That's good stuff. Because if you're here today and you've loved Jesus and you drew close to Jesus and you said yes to Jesus and you lived the life and then life got in the way and, and things happened and, and you got hurt and you got blown up by life, and you've drifted away. And Jesus says, come on back over here. Nothing's lost. Nothing's lost. I love you, and I care about you. Man, I've let things get in the way, Jesus. I've let life, or I've let just stuff and junk. You don't know where I've been, God. You can't accept me back. God says, I know where you've been. Come on over here, because I love you, and I care about you. Everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And I will raise him or her up on the last day. God's got a promise in on your life if you've said yes to Him. And if you took a little detour, if you, took a, if you got off on a little rest stop and stayed a little too long, if you fell off the road into a cavern of despair, God says, I love you and I care about you and come on back. Third for today, the Lord Jesus proclaimed our eternal security through God, the Father, and Himself. I read from John 10, verses 28 and 30. I, Jesus speaking, give them eternal life and they will never perish. Mm. and no one will snatch them from my hand. There's where we need to live, folks. Right there in the palm of Jesus. Jesus holds us. And no one will snatch them from my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father am one. So I'm reading from John 10, 28 through 30. The next time someone says, Jesus never said he was God, I and the Father are one. Jesus proclaims he is Lord. He speaks in terms within the vernacular of the day in a Jewish way, in a way that the Jews would hear because Jesus came to preach and to offer himself as Messiah to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. Nobody snatches me or you from the hand of Jesus. Now, hey, look, man, you could, be, you could be in a thunderstorm right now. You could be in a tornado right now. You could be in Hurricane Harvey all over again, multiplied by 10 in your life, but you're resting right there if you know Jesus. Your circumstances, the things external of you, your surroundings, and hey, even a few self-inflicted gunshot wounds. Now, I know about you. I don't know about you, but I can speak about me. I have shot myself in the foot more times than I'd like to confess to. Amen? But even in my own self-inflicted sin, God does not forsake me. Amen? That's the real deal stuff. A God that loves you beyond your sin. Yes, my sin damages my relationship with the Father. That's another sermon, and that's a true sermon. Amen? 
But my sin does not cause God to say, oh, you're getting a little nasty. I'm just going to push you away. Doesn't do that. We are secure in God. Fourth for today. Salvation is God's work, not our work. And it is His power that keeps us. I read from Titus 3, verses 5 and 6. So in my version here, I've inserted some words to better identify the he that is spoken about, okay? So Titus 3, 5 and 6. He, God the Son, saved us. Not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to His, God the Father, own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He, God the Father, poured out on us richly through Christ our Savior. And what is significant to me in this particular verse we have the entire Godhead involved in a statement about our salvation. God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are actively involved in your salvation. I would say that they're also actively involved in your sanctification, that process for the rest of your life. We must believe in that salvation comes by belief that Jesus really is who he says he is. It comes through confession, our need to understand that our life is not our own. It is his. That's what believing in him is. You, we believe that he is taking us, leading us, guiding us on a, a journey that we wouldn't normally go with our own flesh. So belief, confession, and submission that indeed our life is not our own. I think that maybe for me is one of the biggest rebellion points. Can I just say that out loud? That somehow I still want my life to be about me, or I want to be in control of my life, or I want to guide my life on my best understanding. That should scare us all to death based on our own best understanding. But submission really is, is surrendering our lives and saying, you know, Lord, you lead me, you guide me. I'll be faithful to go. I'll be willing and available. You take me on the journey. And then my life becomes about recognizing in the journey opportunities. Moments when he says, here you go, Bill, go do this. And I go like, uh, me? And he says, yeah, you. And then you know how you feel when you step in that moment? Totally unprepared, totally unequipped, totally lacking in knowledge. And what happens? God shows up. And you're going like, where did that come from? A scripture comes out. I don't even remember reading that scripture. All that past work, commitment, study, prayer. And God takes you into a moment where you do something. An action. You say a word. You negotiate a group. And you're just like, what's going on? Because I don't have the ability to do this. And you know what? You're right. But he does. He does. And when you yield to him and he takes you into that moment, then, you're are, then you are becoming his agent. You are doing kingdom work. You become his voice in his hands and his feet. So a couple cautions for us in being fully surrendered to God. That's a key word, Fully. One here in Matthew, I read from Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Jesus speaking, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Side note, uh uh-oh. Continuing, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus says the one who enters into heaven is the one who's done the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Man, I'm telling you, for me, this is the scariest scripture in the Bible. Just for me. 
Because you know what I see in there is many will say, didn't we prophesy in your name? The implication is the prophecy was a legitimate prophecy. And cast out demons in your name. The implication is, is that some of these people will stand before Jesus who in their lives did an act, an action. They intervened. They stepped in. They used the name of Jesus. And they addressed demons in someone's life. And the demons departed in the name of Jesus. And these people did that. And do, my, many, other, do many mighty works in your name. The scriptures imply those things really did happen or will happen for some people before Jesus. And Jesus declares to him, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me. You workers of lawlessness. Oh, man. This is, I think there's an... I think there's something in there about talking the talk but not walking the walk, I want to say. It's a scary scripture maybe for the nominal, for the carnal Christian. For the person who is faithful to come to church on a Sunday, has no desire to grow or has not grown in their faith life, does not discern what God is doing in their life and respond to that discernment. I don't know exactly what that looks like for that person in the future, those people in the future. Here's what I really want to say today. Don't let Jesus say this to you. Don't be this guy or gal. Don't be that guy or guy, guy or gal at the judgment seat. And last for today, concerning eternal security, I read from Hebrews. This is a, this is a particular scripture that messes a lot of people up. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and 6. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened. So let me take a sidestep. Hebrews, the book written probably by Paul. There's some disagreement exactly the writer. But the writer is writing to former Jews who have become Christians who are struggling a little bit in their newfound faith. They're being drawn back to the works, to the law. And let's just, can I just say it? I love the works and the law. Amen? Give me ten rules to follow. I'm in, man. I'm in. I'm a rule follower. Probably because I was once a rule enforcer. Makes sense to me. Give me a checklist. One, two, three, four, five. If I do them in order and I do them in a timely way, then I'm good with you, right? So in this book, in the book of Hebrews, some of the folks that have responded to Jesus and stepped in as early Christians, man, that we, we could be going back to the temple and, and animal sacrifices and all the cool stuff instead of faith. Man, I don't even know what that looks like. So the writer in Hebrews is writing to that group of people encouraging them and challenging them. So back to the scripture. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. So going back to the first one, it's impossible in that case to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again, the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Some people use this as a way to explain that you can lose your salvation. And in fact, if you do lose your salvation, there's no way back to Jesus. It's, this, this portion of Scripture today is still debated among Christians. And the truth is, as I and winding this sermon down. I can't fully reconcile that for all of us today. There is a reconciliation, I believe, in, to that claim. But the point I would like for us to see today in this verse, and remember that this book of Hebrews was written to new Christians who had come out of Judaism. And the writer in Hebrews gives examples and connections for those new Christians from the former works slash Jewish Uh, life, religious life, it gives them ways to connect in their new faith to Jesus. The, The bulk of Hebrews is there was an old way and there is a better new way. That's a terminology you will see in that book. Following Jesus is better than the old way. 
and there was nothing left for them in the old ways. So this portion of Scripture deals very specifically in context with a group of people. If someone holds that particular verse up to you to say that you don't have eternal security, you have a plethora of Scriptures to be able to be able to bring back up and say, what about these scriptures? This scripture is, was specifically in the day written for those Jews who wanted to go back to an old religious system. Today we've talked about salvation. And, and within the doctrinal statement of Solid Rock Church, we say that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And that makes people mad. Amen? Amen. People are going to get mad when you say Jesus is the only way to heaven. Can I just encourage you to remind them that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Because it's true. And if you will spend the time and invest the time and love them, and love them when they get mad at you because they'll get mad at you, amen? When they raise objections, and they will raise objections, and you let them raise objections, and you just keep pointing them back to Jesus. See, the truth is, is all of us in humanity have to make, have to come to a decision about Jesus. We're all going to choose what we do with Jesus. And, and the very simplest of way to say that, we're going to say yes or no to Jesus. And if you say yes to Jesus and you're genuine in that, and you're authentic in that, and you're as transparent and honest in that as you can be, then you've made a genuine, honest response to Jesus and Jesus will honor that but sometimes we make the mistake of saying yes to Jesus and say "Ooh, punch that ticket I'm good I've got eternal salvation and I believe if you were earnest and honest and, and, and confess that and that Jesus came into your heart that you are saved but you can miss out on a lot of what God has for you by not developing and growing in your faith life eternal security I think the scriptures that we've read today and talked about I hope encourages you that your salvation is eternal that your salvation is permanent now look there's real things in life and you're going to be you may run into a train wreck and you may get distracted and and the old devil will come in and condemn you but the scriptures say there is no condemnation for those people that are in Christ Jesus And if you're feeling condemned today because you hadn't walked the walk that you really want to walk or you know you're supposed to walk, if you've drifted away and you hear that condemning voice, that's not God. Amen? There's only one condemner. There's one accuser. There's one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. If you have drifted away, God says, come on back. I love you and care about you. Come on back. And so today we're going to go to lunch here in just in a bit. But I want to pause for a prayer time. A time for you to really kind of look down in your heart and go like, man, you know, you're, what'd you, you read my mail there, Pastor Bill? No, I didn't read your mail. I just do a sermon that God calls me to do. Amen. But you can, we're going to spend just a little time in prayer before we go to the meal. So you can pray with people at your tables. They'd love to do that. You can pray with people across the room. Um, If you need some help in prayer, I see my brother Fred is over here. He'd love to pray for you. George is in the back by the, suspiciously by the food line. I'm just pointing that out. So George would be available to pray for you. Miss Maria is on the end of the start of the uh, food line over here. If a lady would like some specific prayer. And Morgan is over here. If you would like Morgan to pray for you. And so I know it's lunch. I know you're starting to get some whiffing of the wonderful aroma. But let's give the Lord some time to move in some folks' lives. So I'm going to ask you to stand and we'll dismiss the lunch here in about 10 minutes or so. And what would the Lord have you do now?
Amen. If you're still praying, keep praying. We just want to uh, encourage you as you wrap up, as you get ready to go. I'm just going to give us a quick prayer for lunch, and, and then you can be dismissed, and the line starts on this end to my left, to your right, and that you, uh, if you're a guest or visitor today, would like for you to be first, so church family, don't trample any new faces, amen, and let them get up there. So, Father God, we say thank you today. Thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Savior, your Son, who came to not condemn us, but to save us. And that you offer us eternal life through him, Father. And Lord, Lord, I just say if there's anybody here today that doesn't know you, Lord Jesus, that today that the Spirit, even over lunch and in this time, would move mightily and that they would ask, who is this Jesus guy? What does this mean for me? And they say that to someone that can give them an honest answer. So, Father, thank you for the food that's provided, your provision of food, your provision of a, a fellowship and grace and mercy. Uh, and we'll express our love for you in a fellowship time called Potluck. Thank you for the hands that are serving, and thank you for the conversations that will happen. We ask all of that in the name of Christ Jesus and all of God's people said,